In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I sit here in the little grotto in my hometown church of Clinton, Mass., St. John, the guardian of Our Lady, church by the great ancestors of the faithful departed. I think so much of my granddad, James Hastings, who was so much a part of that early new evangelization of the Catholic Church. I think of my dad being such a pillar of this particular church on the altar as a lector for 45 years plus. Both my mom and my dad were catechists here in this particular church for many years and did great honor and service to Jesus by proclaiming the truth of the Catholic faith. I will be faithful to those words of our Lord through Mary and keep my teaching faithful to the Catholic Catechism to now honor my parents, John and Mary Kilcoyne, with my ministry in gratitude for one great life lived. Amen. Talk Catholic. And now Talk Catholic with Tim Kilcoyne, a show about faith and other teachings. TalkCatholic.com on the eve of Valentine's Day. And this might be an interesting sequel, an opportunity to lay bare facts instead of fiction and lies. Who was St. Valentine? I think there's the key. Only associated with the giving of chocolates and romance and kisses. All good. But we most of the time, we have no idea where it's coming from because we don't read our history. Those who don't read history are doomed to make the same mistakes. So let's take a quick look at a website, History Hit. Dot com. On February 14th, around the year 270, a Roman priest called Valentine was stoned and beheaded. In 496, Pope Galatius marked 14 February as St. Valentine's Day in dedication of his martyrdom. For centuries, St. Valentine has been associated with romance, love, and devotion, yet little is really known about his life. Well, here's a few facts. By most accounts, St. Valentine was a clergyman, either priest or bishop, in the 3rd century Roman Empire. Around 270, he was martyred during a general persecution of Christians. According to the Nuremberg Chronicle of 1493, he was beaten with clubs and finally beheaded for aiding Christians in Rome. The golden legend of 1260 claimed St. Valentine refused to deny Christ before the Emperor Claudius II and was executed outside the Flaminian Gate. As a result, his martyrdom of 14 February became his Saint's Day, which has been observed as the Feast of St. Valentine's Day. He had the power of healing. One popular legend describes St. Valentine as a former bishop of Tyranny in central Italy, while under house arrest by the judge Asterius, the two men discussed their respective fates. Asterius brought his adopted blind daughter to St. Valentine and asked him to help her see again. Valentine, praying to God, laid his hands on her eyes and the child regained her sight. Immediately humbled, the judge converted to Christianity, became baptized, and released all his Christian prisoners, including Valentine. Can you see the power of church authority when exercised? properly relative to the state. Perfect example, the holy hands, the ordained holy hands of our priests and bishops. Not to forget, only words of truth for Jesus can make a huge difference. Let us continue. As a result, Valentine became the patron saint, among other things, of healing. Years after his release, Valentine was arrested once again for evangelizing and sent to Claudius II. The emperor was said to have taken a liking to him until Valentine tried to persuade him to embrace Christianity. Claudius refused and condemned the clergyman to death. Think about this. Can you imagine the anger, the guilt, the disdain for the Christian story in in general, St. Valentine is simply sharing Christ with this emperor. He doesn't believe in him. Off to death. Off to the guillotine. Ladies and gentlemen, this kind of quote-unquote terrorism is still at work today, ever too close to us. It certainly started in 1973 with Roe v. Wade, and Euthanasia is not just a concept, but being mulled over down at your local legislature. And we, as like St. Valentine, need to tell our love story of Christ in our lives. It can make a difference. When the state has any role to play in life issues, it doesn't go well. And it is always up to the church, especially, to stand up. And remember, every pope in the first 300 years of the church was martyred. 300 years is a very long time to us. 
It may not be to our Lord, but it's more than a couple of lifetimes, that's for sure. And I don't think we need to go through it again. Can we leave these pages of history to the past? So think about where we're at these days. Getting back to our story, he was commanded to either renounce his faith or face death. On the day of his execution, he wrote a note to Asterius' daughter, the child he had healed from blindness and befriended. According to legend, he signed the letter, from your valentine. So, remember that when you give that box of chocolates, think of the historical context. It will make your love all the more meaningful. He was getting ready to be executed for simply having healed somebody. Wow, wicked stuff and evil hasn't changed. His skull is on display in Rome. In the early 19th century, the excavation of a catacomb near Rome produced the skeletal remains and other relics now associated with St. Valentine. In 1836, the Carmelite priest John Spratt received a gift from Pope Gregory the 16th containing a small vessel tinged with St. Valentine's blood. The gift was taken to the White Friar Street Carmelite Church in Dublin, Ireland, where it remains. The church continues to be a popular place of pilgrimage, especially for those seeking love on St. Valentine's Day. St. Valentine's holy duties are not limited to interceding in loving couples and marriages. He is also the patron saint of beekeepers, epilepsy, plague, i.e. the virus, fainting, and traveling. His association with love began in the Middle Ages. St. Valentine's Saint Day has been associated with the tradition of courtly love since the Middle Ages. At the time, it was believed that birds paired in mid-February. Throughout the period, 14 February is mentioned as a day that brought lovers together, most poetically as the birds and the bees. According to the 18th century historians Alban Butler and Francis Deuce, Valentine's Day was most likely created to overpower the pagan holiday, Lupercalia. So, ladies and gentlemen, unlike the response, the holy response that we're still waiting for relative to the Pachamamas inside the Vatican on holy ground. In the early days of Christianity's birth as the religion of the Roman Empire, when Constantine protected Christians and the Edict of Milan gave freedom of worship throughout the empire, now the pagan holidays and idols which had been only there to support the pagan emperors, were now completely eradicated. Not entered into dialogue with. Like, it needs to be said today, nothing. What can we learn from evil? These idols were eliminated, and the holidays off the calendar. Were we being too imposing of our faith? Not if it's true. These holidays and idols were seen for what they exactly were, evil, replacing the true God with something else that elevated man to the same position. A pretty common story throughout human history. And now Christ and the veneration of relics, statues, art, and other holy objects, all lifted up to our Lord, were now viewed collectively by the mainstream, not media, but people, the regular folk, God's people, holding in common these things to be true as the cornerstone of, of a healthier society. It's a highly recommended, historically tried and true formula to follow. We don't need to embrace false gods and enter into dialogue with them. We need to, ladies and gentlemen, get rid of them. Be gone, Satan. Finally, no solid evidence exists of the romantic celebrations on 14 February prior to Chaucer's Parliament of Fools, written in 1375. In this poem, Chaucer linked a tradition of courtly love with the celebration of St. Valentine's Feast Day when birds and humans came together to find a mate. He wrote, by the 1400s, nobles inspired by Chaucer were writing poems known as Valentine's to their love interests. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen, the truth to the best that we have it regarding St. Valentine. And again, the question remains, how come we never hear about that story? Why is it that the trials and tribulations of St. Valentine's life seem to be forgotten? Nobody ever brings them up as something to remember around Valentine's Day. We only think of it as, again, exchange of kisses and hugs. All good. Never enough. But not all the truth. Not all what Valentine's Day should represent for us today. He's a special saint to pray to relative to the pandemic and the virus. Also, he clearly was a trooper against the state. This is a man, again, relative to Claudius, the emperor Claudius. He doesn't want to come in to embrace the the Christian faith. 
And so he has them executed. Easy stuff to do, I guess. When you're the emperor, head of state, and could be coming in our direction if we don't get things right here in America. Truth telling. The truth. It's everything. It's your salvation. It's the very essence of God. Ladies and gentlemen, let us continue on with the dissection of lying with Professor Peter Kreft leading us into the operating table. I really want to get into this in all of its nuances because as I said in the previous show, this is the commandment that we are most of the time breaking. And so we need to know all of its shades of light, gray, and dark. Let us begin. Now, in our last session on lying, I finished up with a little excerpt from People of the Lie by M. Scott Peck, where he was referring to a particular clinical situation of the daughter uh, of a older woman mother who had been known to uh, hoard and think that she was two steps from the pauper line. And her younger daughter was recently married and she simply needed a little extra cash uh, for her car and to get it repaired. And she wouldn't give it to her. And yet this mother had more than enough. And so the point was that M. Scott Peck was trying to more than suggest there was evil at work in the mother. Now, it may not have been conscious to her, the mother herself, but it was really very much evil that was behind the lying, which it always is. There's no one else that you're making a pact with when you lie. Whether it's subconscious or conscious is a different issue for the mediation of sin in the confessional, for sure. But he was pointing out something I believe is unbelievably important if we're going to get this lying thing correct for family life. The woman, the daughter, did not want to believe that because it's her mother. Like, her mother doesn't sin. Her mother can't be part of evil. But in fact, she could be. And this is the biggest problem, and I firmly believe this, for most families in general who seem to be understanding of these things when it happens to other people's families, but not their own. That somehow, that's everybody else. But that can't be us. And in fact, we sadly admit, in the end, it is us. It's exactly us. Our own families sin. Our own families lie, no matter the levels of devotion to one another. Might I say that one more time? No matter the level of devotion to each other, you may be there for each other, yet living a lie. Yes, it is not just the gangs in the inner city. This is us, and we got to come to grips with that and not keep shooting the messenger in not acknowledging that lying in a variety of ways, shapes, and forms is taking place, and in some cases, over a very long period of time in your family's life. And unless you throw a hand grenade into it called truth, it just keeps going on and on and on and on. And any family that might be wrapped up in addiction scenarios knows exactly what I'm talking about. Remembering our previous show, Professor Kreft reminded us of the following Believing the darkness of Satan's lie rather than the light of God's commandment was the beginning of the fall and continues to be the beginning of every fall. We eat the forbidden fruit of falsehood with our minds before we eat any other forbidden fruit with our bodies and our deeds. So again, the truth starts within, and that applies to your family as much as it does yourself. When there's some kind of contradiction to the revealed word of God, as Professor Kreft said to us also, then it is not of the light. So we always need to juxtapose our lives with the scriptures. What exactly has our Lord said relative to some of the situations that we find ourselves in, namely, lying to ourselves about who we are? I'll never forget the difficulty, I must say, on on the part of myself when I went off to college, Boston College, and I was more or less pressured into believing by my guidance counselor in high school that I would do best as an accountant. <laughs> oh boy, if there was anything that was about as far removed from my my level of expertise. Or more importantly, my interest. And so I entered the School of Management at Boston College and I proceeded to get C's and D's 
uh, in the first couple of semesters. I hated it. I had no interest in it, and I wasn't good at it. And it was a great crisis of identity, as we would like to uh, journey in our diaries. I knew that this was not me. This was a big fat lie, and it was bearing the lack of fruit of C's and D's. I can't even imagine what four years of that journey would have bore if I just kept lying to myself that this was going to be my vocation. And by the grace of God and persistence in listening to his still small voice, I proceeded to go against the grain of everybody, including family members at the time, and entering the School of Education as a theology and psychology major. What now? (laughs) What's he going to do with that? But my grades skyrocketed almost immediately. Not almost, they did. It was so obvious that I, you know, that I made the right decision, the peace that came to me, and the fruit. When we come back, we'll take a look at another excerpt from M. Scott Peck's book, People of the Lie, with more reflection by Professor Peter Kreft. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. A most happy Valentine's Day. In referencing the story that M. Scott Peck relayed relative to the daughter, her name was Angela, trying to get a little money from her mom to repair her car, he says, we all tend to be more or less self-centered in our dealings with others. We usually view any given situation first and foremost from the standpoint of how it affects us personally, and only as an afterthought do we bother to consider how the same situation might affect someone else involved. Nonetheless, if we care for the other person, we usually can and eventually do think about his or her viewpoint, which may well be different from ours. Not so with those who are evil. Theirs is a brand of narcissism so total that they seem to lack in whole or in part this capacity for empathy. We can see that their narcissism makes the evil dangerous not only because it motivates them to scapegoat others, but also because it deprives them of the restraint that results from empathy and respect for others. In addition to the fact that the evil need victims to sacrifice to their narcissism, their narcissism permits them to ignore the humanity of their victims as well. The blindness of the narcissist to others can extend even beyond a lack of empathy. Narcissists may not see others at all. Angela's mother obviously lacked empathy. She did not see Angela as Angela. She did not see the validity of Angela's predicament. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the basic theme here, that truth either starts within the soul or lies and evil begin to engulf the soul through the habitual actions of our life through our habits of speech. Sin does not typically happen in a snapshot. It's a pattern. And so this darkening of the soul, which is the gradual inward dwelling of self-centeredness, is exactly what blinds people to truth. And so, especially within a Christian context, we have to get to the light. Now, our church gives us clear-cut shortcuts to the light. His light, Jesus. They're called the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Needless to say, now too many don't even know of such sacraments. But the beginning of a natural law path to goodness and truth would be to grab on to rational truth wherever it might be and weigh it against the consequences that are the result. By their fruit ye shall know them. Look at the actions. Look at the fruit or lack thereof, and you can get a sense of whether you're moving in the direction of light to be able to see. This whole concept of spiritual eyesight is what is so lacking in today's world. We cover it up with all kinds of psychological constructs, defense mechanisms, hereditary and environmental influences rule the day, such as alcoholic thinking. There's an ever popular defense mechanism that would lead you to believe that people that are covering for alcoholics have the right to behave the way they do in trying to lie about their loved ones. Well, there's a much more theological interpretation of that It is called lying for loved ones equals darkness of the mind and the inability 
to see the right thing to do. We have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that before psychology, there was only theology and philosophy. And one could simply argue that psychology is just another form of philosophy, taking into account social, behavioral data, but not giving us the real questions as to why people behave the way they do. And this has been the age-old domain of the philosophers and theologians. And thus, it should remain so. Just because we can give labels to people's behavior, defense mechanisms, hyperactive, maladjustment, attention deficit syndrome, the list is endless, does not hide exactly what the person is doing to themselves or others. They are simply being selfish, not thinking of others, not willing to do the right thing. This has been the problem since the late 60s. I've alluded to this before, where modern day psychology, with all its elaborate and articulate terms, somehow replaces the age-old theological answers. And for us Catholic Christians, we do in fact have them in the scriptures, in our catechism, and other voices of the church, the doctors of the church, etc. Let us quickly turn to Professor Peter Kreft to what I'm talking about in terms of this darkness of the mind and how it can be enlighten. He says on page 270 in Catholic Christianity, the importance of truth for morality. Man, having both body and soul, lives in two worlds, a material world and a moral and spiritual world. God ordered man's physical world by the days of creation. Then he ordered man's moral and spiritual world by the Ten Commandments. The source of both orders is truth. In all cultures, light is the natural symbol an expression of truth. No good work can be done without light. The world's best doctor and the world's best hospital and the world's best technology cannot perform the simplest operation without light. God himself did not order the universe without light. He created light first. Created light was the first reflection of uncreated light. Light came first for God, and it must come first for us too if we are to echo God's will and God's priorities. Our very choice must be, let there be light. We must love and seek and live and speak the truth. Can I say that one more time? We must love and seek and live and speak the truth. For if we do not love the truth, we will not know it. If we do not seek it first with our will, we will not find it with our mind. The crucial importance of truth for morality is not generally understood today. People are rarely taught that morality is more than kindness and compassion, i.e. the gospel of nice, more than good intentions, even more than love. For love without truth is not true love. Love and truth are equally absolute, for both are divine attributes, infinite and eternal. Truth and love are what God is made of. These two are one in God, and the more godly we are, the more they are one in us. Oh, is that, is that as good as it gets, ladies and gentlemen? And do you feel that way? And if you don't, you've got to keep listening. This is the tragedy, ladies and gentlemen, within our church for too many years. Because from the pulpit, we are always hearing much about love, kindness, compassion, charity. Rarely do you hear that word truth. And there's the difference between more than a few years ago when the church was living her calling to holiness more fully and fruitfully to bear fruit of thousands and thousands of parishes that have now closed their doors. Evangelization is the reason for the church's very existence, which means the proclamation of God's word, which equals love and truth together, God himself. There is the key to the church's renewal there will be the key to our renewal in the secular realm, the political realm, and every other realm, science, technology, etc. The church must lead, her shepherds must teach, and everyone else in between who calls themselves a disciple of our Lord. The last movie I took a look at to finish off the Christmas season was Going My Way with Bing Crosby. Check out that movie, and you will see the church in her glory in her splendor. And it was a society that was just simply exuding the Holy Spirit. He was in the air like the decorations themselves. We can do it again, ladies and gentlemen. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. Have a great week, everyone. Let your light shine. 
That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. But we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be his voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please, my number is 877-625-3727. Tim Kilcoyne, TalkCatholic.com. St. Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.